And so, Lord God, if the truth were to be known, I think most of us came here this morning to get something, which means we probably didn't come here this morning to serve you something, and this is called the worship service. So, Father, I pray that um, this morning we would give you something. We would, well, the hallelujahs would be multiplied. And, Father, I pray that you would remind us that we can't give you anything that you haven't first given to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to preach and that it would all be worship. In Jesus' name, amen. read about uh, Kathy <clears throat> in a support letter that I received years ago from Covenant House Shelter in New York. Kathy came to the front door of the shelter one Tuesday morning. She was dressed in dirty rags and holding a paint can. She was a mystery to the sisters at the shelter. Whatever she did, wherever she went, she clutched this little aluminum paint can when she would take a shower. The paint can would be right there, just to the side. When she would change her clothes, the paint can would rest against her feet. I'm sorry, this is mine, she would tell the sisters at the shelter. This can belongs to me. When Sister Mary Ellen would inquire, saying, would you like to tell me what's in that can? Kathy would respond, uh, not today, not, not today. When her little soul seemed especially dry, when she was sad or angry or hurt, which was quite a bit, Kathy would take her paint can and go upstairs to the third floor to her quiet dorm room and just hold the can all alone. Many times, Sister Mary Ellen would pass by her room and watch her. She'd be rocking back and forth, uh, the can wrapped in her arms, her hair swaying across her shoulders. Sometimes, in a low whisper, she'd talk to the can. Sometimes she'd even kiss the can as if she were worshiping the can. Early one morning, Sister Mary Ellen asked Kathy to sit with her and have some breakfast. They sat and rested for a while talking quietly about nothing in particular. Then Sister Mary Ellen McGeady took a deep breath and said, um, that's a really nice can. What's in it? Kathy didn't answer, not for a long time. She rocked back and forth, clutching the can. Then with tears in her eyes, she looked at Sister Mary Ellen. It's my mother, she said. What do you mean it's your mother, asked Sister Mary Ellen. It, it's my mother's ashes, Kathy said. I went and got them from the funeral home. See, I even asked them to put a little label right here on the side of the can. It's her name on the can. Kathy held the can up for Sister Mary Ellen to, to see. Then she pulled it close once again and hugged it. I never really knew my mother, said Kathy. I mean, she threw me in the garbage just two days after I was born. The sisters checked her story, and sure enough, the newspapers had run a story that the police had found an infant girl in a dumpster just two days after Kathy's birthday. I ended up living in a lot of foster homes, said Kathy. I ended in a lot of, of, a lot of foster homes mad at, at my mom. But then I decided I was going to try and find her. I, I got lucky. Someone knew where she was living. I went to her house, and she wasn't there, sister. She was in the hospital. She had AIDS. I went to the hospital and I got to meet her the day before she died. My mother told me she loved me. 
Kathy cried. She told me she loved me. Sister Mary Ellen reached out to hug Kathy, but it was really hard to hug Kathy because, you know, her arms were wrapped around that can. She just would not part with the part with the can. She just would not let go of that can. Just a taste of love, and she wouldn't let go of that can. She would not stop worshiping that can, that can of ashes. She thought it was her life, although it was literally a can, a can of death. I, I don't know if Kathy ever put the can down. Not yet. But have you? We all carry a can of ashes, ashes of broken relationships and shattered dreams, and yet we're addicted to those dreams and those bad relationships. And so in secret, we drink the ashes and only get more and more thirsty. We only become more aware of our sorry, empty selves. So, so Sister Mary Ellen asked, what's in that can? I think Jesus would ask you, what's in that can that you hold so tightly to your chest? Let's talk about that thirst of yours, because I'd like to give you a drink. John chapter 4, verse 3, Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, you know, the number six is absolutely loaded with meaning. It's the day that humans are made in the image of God. Shikar, or Sikar, actually means drunk or drunken. In Old Testament times, the town was named Sikkim or Shechem, Sikkim, but now that the Samaritans occupied it, the Jews referred to it as Sikar, drunk town. About the sixth hour, that's noon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Strict Jewish men wouldn't even talk to a woman in public, let alone a Samaritan woman, let alone an estranged Samaritan woman. And this woman must have been estranged. She was alone. It was customary for women to go to the well in the cool of the day together, just as it's customary, and I think probably genetic, in our society for women at fine restaurants to go to the, to the restroom together. Just saying, some things never change. Well, anyway, this Samaritan woman is alone for a reason. Jesus tells the guys to go on ahead, and he sits down, for a reason. It was strange that they were traveling through Samaria in the first place, but Jesus went this way for a reason. He was thirsty. Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well's deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't be thirsty and have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Let me paraphrase. What's in that paint can you're holding so tightly to your chest? What's in that terracotta water jar that you carry wherever you go? What have you been drinking that leaves you so thirsty? Verse 17, the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Dang. Jesus does not skirt the painful issues, does he? In that culture, only the man could divorce the woman, so more than likely this woman had been 
rejected five times by five different husbands, and yet each time she would desperately return to the source of her wounds, marrying into the same situation. And now she's with the sixth man. You drink and men, said Jesus. What you have said is true. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Love that line. <laughs> You're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. It appears that she's evading the subject, but she's stumbled into the very heart of the subject. Worship. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and the hour is now here. That would be what? That would be the seventh hour. The hour is coming, and the hour is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Literally translated, he said this, I am as in I am that I am. <laughs> Literally, he said, I am the one speaking to you. And so God just asked to drink from her cup and offered her a drink from his cup. That would be a drinking party, a communion between the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and this Samaritan woman. Just then, verse 27, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you, what do you seek or, or why are you talking with her? So, so the woman left her water jar. I mean, she left her, her paint can. She left her ashes and broken dreams. She left her earthen vessel, her terracotta water jar. It's like she forgot why she had gone to the well in the first place. It's like she came for a drink, and now she's drunk. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? It's a pretty intriguing story. And it kind of leaves you wondering, did Jesus ever get his drink in the town called Drunk? Andrew Trawick preached a wonderful sermon on this text last year, and we're going to preach on this text again next week. But for now, I'd just like to point out a few things and then ask about your water jar, your paint can, and what you've been drinking. I hope you notice how Jesus engineered that dialogue from thirst to promiscuity to worship. Three topics that seem very unconnected, but upon reflection are entirely connected. Uh, this woman was attempting to satisfy her deepest thirst with men, which I might say is entirely understandable, because you know uh, we're pretty great. But she'd drink, and each man would leave her even more thirsty than before. She'd drink, just as Kathy drank, from her mother's paint can, and the ashes didn't satisfy, but it left her even more thirsty than before. Just as an alcoholic drinks, and over time each drink satisfies less and less and leaves the alcoholic more and more and more thirsty. Just as every sinner sins, takes a little life, drinks a little life, the life dies, the sinner dies, and we're all sinners. Well, Jesus reveals a few fascinating things about himself in our paint cans, and then he makes an outrageous promise. But anyway, he reveals, number one, that he knows us. It's like he swims in our, our paint can. He knows all about the six men. Maybe he and his father even arranged for the six men to reveal the seventh man at the sixth hour. It was about the sixth hour on the sixth day, according to John, who's extremely artistic about all of these things and very intentional. It was about the sixth hour on the sixth day that, that according to John, Pontius Pilate said to the Jews, Behold the man. Behold the king. 
and then delivered him up for crucifixion on the tree in, in the garden. We do know God doesn't will evil, and yet he clearly wills that we would encounter evil. So maybe the six men prepared this woman for the seventh man, the last man, the eschatos Adam, her bridegroom. They made her thirsty for him. Maybe the six prepared for the seventh, like the six days of creation prepare for the eternal seventh day. Maybe the ashes, maybe all the ashes of your broken dreams and shattered relationships prepare you to meet the king of kings and ask him for a drink. You think no one knows, but he knows. And number two, you know him. You know him more and more every day. He's the good in everything that's anything. He's the life in your veins. He's the man in all those stories in the Bible. Even better, he's sitting by your well in the dust and the ashes right now. The world worships what they do not know, but you do know him a bit. Jesus said, I am the one who is speaking to you. Jesus is the word of God speaking to you and speaking you right now into existence and asking you for a drink. Number three, God the Father is looking for worshipers. If you ever ask, what does, because people are always asking me this, you know, what does God want? If you, what does God want? Well, this is your answer, worship. Right now and always. Everything we do is the worship of something. Did, did you know that? To worship something is to exalt something. And you see, we are always exalting something. We're always exalting God or ourselves or, or something. God is looking for those that would worship him in spirit and in truth. In truth, perhaps that means, you know, from your paint can. So you don't need me, you don't need Vince, you don't need the band. Maybe you just need your paint can. In truth and in spirit, that's a little more confusing because where's the spirit? Where's the breath of God right now? Well, God desires worship, and number four, if we don't worship God, we'll worship something and thereby turn that something into an idol and so destroy ourselves and that idol. This Samaritan woman was on her sixth man it's entirely possible, okay, I don't know this, but it's entirely possible that she was not an easy woman to live with. Perhaps she expected each man to quench her thirst. None of them could, and so she sucked each one dry. Larry Crabb used to say, most marriages are like two ticks and no dog. <laughs> So here's the very best marriage counseling I can give. Worship God so you don't expect your spouse to be God. And so suck the life out of your spouse trying to satisfy an infinite and eternal thirst, leaving only dust and ashes in the wake of your idolatry. Expecting Susan to be God, I end up addicted to Susan. All the while hating Susan and cursing God because of Susan. Expecting men to be God, this woman became addicted to men, but probably hated men, hated herself, and the creator of both. Expecting her mom to be God, Kathy became addicted to ashes, and yet more and more thirsty for love, and God is love. Expecting wine to be God, you'll become a slave to wine. Hating your master, but constantly serving your master, you'll drink to get drunk by an unworthy master. An idol. But number five, if and when we worship God, this is so cool, idols turn into temples. Wine isn't God, and yet God can be in wine, like oxygen in, in blood. So when we drink it in memory of him, an idol becomes a temple, we call it communion. <laughs> Not debauchery, worship. Kathy's mom wasn't God, and yet any love in Kathy's mom was God in Kathy's mom. 
And so once Kathy worshiped God, she could thank God for her mom, but ditch the paint can for she would know, well, you can't keep love in a can. D did you know that? Those six men weren't God, but any life in those men, any good in those men was God in those men. And once the Samaritan woman met the seventh man, perhaps she could praise God for all men and all women and all things. Susan isn't God. But I've been blown away time and time and time and time again. Yes, yes, yes. I've been blown away time and time again to find God in Susan. She's my favorite temple. Yep, and my favorite place to worship. Number six, you are the last idol, and you are the temple of the living God. You are your own last idol. Sounds like the sounds of pain coming from the bowels of the church. But, so. but you are your own last idol. Satan tells each of us that we must make ourselves into the image of God. And believing him, believing that we make ourselves into the image of God, what do we make? An idol. It's called your ego. But when we come to believe that God is the one who has made, will make, and is making us in his own image, we do what? We stop exalting ourselves. And we begin to exalt our creator, and we become the temple that in truth we actually are. Jesus said, the hour is coming, the seventh hour, when neither on this mountain, that's Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans said the temple should be built, or in Jerusalem, that's Mount Zion, where the Jews said the temple should be built, in neither place will you worship the Father. You see, in truth, this Samaritan woman is the temple. She's the temple. And so are you. Number seven, in the temple there is a fountain that was once a well. Jesus says, the water that I will give him or her will become in him or her a spring of water welling up to eternal life like a water fountain. Have you ever noticed that that's just a strange thing to say? I mean, this used to bug me all the time. It just occurred to me this week how much it bugged me that Jesus kind of messed it up. Why? Well, because the water's going the wrong direction, right? If somebody gives you a drink of water, it doesn't well up from inside of you. What does it do? It drops down your gullet, down your esophagus, into your stomach like, like a well. But the water Jesus gives is going the wrong direction. Unless, of course, he gives it to you on the inside. So it would flow out of you like a fountain. Perhaps he gives it to you from behind a curtain where he has always been in some hidden form. Ever since God breathed his breath, his spirit, into the terracotta jar of clay that you call yourself. Jeremiah claims that the Lord is, quote, the fountain of living water. You know, in Jesus' day, living water referred to moving water as opposed to stagnant water like in the bottom of, of a well. In the Song of Solomon, the shepherd sings, A garden locked is my sister, my bride, a spring lock, a, a fountain sealed. The prophets prophesied that, quote, on that day, Zechariah, a fountain will be opened, uh, Joel, a fountain from the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord. Ezekiel has a vision of the fountain flowing from the sanctuary, the house of the Lord, and turning into a river, a river of life that flows into the Dead Sea, the abyss. It flows into the abyss, it flows into the Dead Sea, and wherever the river goes, it brings life. In the Revelation, John sees the river of life flowing from the throne, and on the throne is enthroned the Lamb of God, standing as if he had just been slain, who is now asking this Samaritan woman for a drink. Why would God in flesh ask any of us for a drink? Seriously. Why would God in flesh ask any one of us for anything? Well, maybe he's fixing to reverse the flow and turn a well into a fountain. And if you are that fountain, perhaps your thirst can only be satisfied by satisfying another's thirst as the other drinks from that fountain, which is you. He drinks you drinking him. 
as you drink him drinking you. Well, anyway, if, if God in flesh were to come and sit by your well and ask you for a drink, and you said, why would you ask me for a drink? And if he then said, well, if you only knew who I am, you would ask for living water, and you said, I want living water, give me some of this living water, what would he say next? Maybe, um, okay, great. Tell me about your divorce. Or maybe, okay, wonderful. Let's talk about your job, your finances, your addictions. Let's talk about the ashes that, that you've been drinking. If he sat by your well, what would he say? To me, I think he might say, Peter, let's uh, talk about your dad. If I have a can of ashes, it, it might be this. <sighs> this. This is literally a box of ashes. <laughs> These are my dad's ashes. Unlike Kathy, I had two very loving parents. But as Kathy experienced the greatest love she knew through her mother, so I think I also experienced the greatest I love, the love, the greatest love I ever knew through my dad. My dad was a shepherd, he was a pastor to our Lord's bride, the church. As a boy, the church really blessed my dad, and she really, she felt like a mother to me. I mean, she sincerely, she gave her life to me. It was amazing. But there came a time when I watched the church literally suck the life right out of my dad, leaving me a can of ashes. About 24 years ago, in an utterly miraculous way, the Lord showed me that I had gone to the ministry because I was so angry at, at the church. Because I watched the church suck the life out of my dad, something in me was attempting to suck the life, suck my life back out of the church, and in the process, fix my dad. And yet, to everyone around me and to myself, it seemed just the opposite. I, I mean, no one, no one worked harder than me for the church. Appeared to sacrifice more than me for the church. But you see, I wanted something from the church. I wanted love. I wanted life. I wanted glory. And I still do. Well, there are these moments when I'm preparing a sermon, and then most of the time as, as I'm giving this sermon, that I, so, I feel just so, so free and so alive and so happy, for in those moments, I think I'm glorifying God, giving Jesus a drink, and the fountain is welling up in me. But sometimes, often before I can even sit down, it's like I start choking on the ashes. Something whispers in my ear. What does she think? You sure looked at your notes a lot. Bet everybody noticed. Last week you didn't have many likes on Facebook. You probably are a heretic. You see, when I'm seeking approval, acceptance, and glory from people, when I'm trying to save myself, create myself, and justify myself, when I'm trying to fix my dad by fixing the church, I just start choking on the ashes, the ashes of broken dreams and shattered relationships. But when I glorify God, I don't only drink, I feel like I'm drunk. 
by God. I lose myself and then find myself in God and happy. You see, when I worship for any reason other than giving a drink to my Lord, it's not worship. It's not worship in, in truth. It's not giving glory, it's taking glory. It's not exalting God, it's using God to exalt myself. It's not worship in truth, and it's not worship in spirit, the spirit of love. But when I'm intent on the Lord's thirst, when, and this is something that's deep down inside of you, when my intention, when my heart, when my mind is intent on the Lord's thirst, I forget my thirst, and yet I drink and find myself drunk by God as if I am His water fountain. He's just more than happy to share all of the water with me. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1, drink and be drunk with love, O oh, friends. Or you can translate it this way, drink and be drunk by love. Isn't that great? Well, anyway, it's a beautiful story in John chapter 6, but John still leaves us wondering, did Jesus ever get his drink, and, you know, is he still thirsty? John, who is this, he really is this absolute artist, mentions the thirst of Jesus only twice in the Gospels, here at the well on Mount Gerizim, and then by another well, actually a pit or a tomb, a well that turns into a fountain on Mount Zion. As his bride takes his life on the tree in the garden on the side of Mount Zion, on the sixth day, around the sixth hour, Jesus cries out, I thirst! And Israel, the bride, Israel, the vineyard of the Lord, gives her Lord sour wine to drink. For 2,000 years, Israel had worshipped, but not in spirit and in truth. And now they crucify the truth and they drain him of spirit. We've all crucified the truth and drained him of spirit, the life, the spirit, the breath that is in the blood. John 19, 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and Paradokan delivered up his spirit. A trickle of blood flowed down the cross where Jesus was enthroned, and that trickle began to form a river. The life is in that river. On Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, the disciples would have drunk the cup in, and they would have drunk the cup in memory of Jesus, and on Pentecost, tongues of fire, tongues of fire fell, and those disciples were filled with the Spirit from the inside out, and they began to worship in spirit. They worshiped in ecstasy, ecstasis, having lost themselves. People thought that they were drunk. They were so happy. And today, you'll drink from the cup in memory of Jesus. And then if you worship in spirit and in truth, if you worship in spirit and truth, Jesus will get his drink. And what does he drink? He drinks you. And what are you? Well, you're dust and spirit, ashes and water. You are broken dreams and hope. You think you're just a paint can or a terracotta water jar. You think you're just a container in, watch wa in which water is, is stored. You are an earthen vessel, but not simply a storage vessel. You are more like a, a blood vessel, and through you will flow a river, the river of life. You know, if a blood vessel decides, chooses, that's its choice, if it chooses to only drink, it becomes a blood clot, right? It dies. But if a blood vessel gives its life away, more life flows in, it becomes a fountain of life and the entire body is happy. These are my dad's ashes, but not my dad. Because I watched him surrender his spirit for 42 years up until the day he died. He worshiped, and now he lives, and he will never die. It turns out that no one took his life. He freely gave Christ's life and is happy. I didn't need to fix him. It's me that needed the fixing. 
All of your problems, all of them, all your problems are due to the fact that you do not worship God in spirit and truth. The solution to all of your problems, all of your problems, is that you would worship God in spirit and in truth. But if you worship God in order to fix your problems, you're not worshiping God. (laughs) You're using God to fix your problems and worshiping yourself. So how do we worship God in spirit and in truth? Well, on the night that he was delivered up by all of us, in the darkest depths of humanity's paint can, I mean, the darkness and the ashes couldn't get any worse than this. On, on that night, when it was obvious that we could not save ourselves, but only damn ourselves, on the night that Jesus was delivered up, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. In the morning, as he hung on the cross, the tree in the garden, As we tried to take his spirit, because that's what we were doing, we were trying to take his life. As we tried to take his spirit, he delivered up his spirit. And it was then that the veil in the temple ripped. It was then that the fountain was opened. You are the temple. And in you is a well that turns into a fountain. Eat, O oh friends. Drink and be drunk by love. Jesus is thirsty. So let's give him a drink. So did you, did, you, did you feel that? The flow reversed, right? On that last song. Then sings my soul, my savior, God to thee. This is called death. And that's called life. And worship is the resurrection of the Christ within you. And each of you has a paint can filled with the ashes of broken relationships and shattered dreams. For those of us who are older, our paint can's larger than some of you, but you have a paint can. And you have a paint can for a reason. You see, I think it's there by design. And that's because worship in spirit and in truth begins in the bottom of your paint can. You may notice that your paint can looks an awful lot like the bottom of your paint can looks an awful lot like that. And you see, that's where, that's where you meet him. So talk to Jesus about your paint can. You'll meet him there, and one day everything you do will be worship. It is actually the only thing that's anything that can be done. So believe the gospel in Jesus' name and worship. If you'd like prayer, members of the prayer team would be down. Nick. Be down front here and he'd love to pray with you. Right, Nick? Okay, I didn't want to lie about you. Okay, all right. Amen. Mm